So we're here with Sue Heller um, and the Crayon des Ponts, Bridges Not Borders, wants to make sure that we capture Sue's thoughts as she's leaving Hemingford because of her incredible involvement around refugee work. So Sue, one of the things that we wanted to hear about your past experience was what it was like for you as a child going through World War II. I was actually nine in 1939. It was quite exciting. Um, we had a gardener and our, our um, land was very straight, beautiful lawn and then a high bank and it went on. So he dug into the bank. Actually it collapsed when war ended. <laughs> but we would go in there and sit. And we got to know all the sounds of the plains. And we'd know whether it was a Heinkel, a Messerschmitt, uh, a Spitfire, which was a much nicer sound. V light and very, very nice. Because we had all kinds of camps all around us with the, the Americans. They had a big camp there. So that was effectively your air raid shelter? Yes, that was our air raid shelter because the house wasn't safe. You know, if they're going to bomb the house, they're not going to be able to see where the shelter is. It was just a little opening. And you went in, then you turned a corner. Because my father said, if they come with a um, revolver, they'll shoot straight and it'll just go into the bank, the other side, the, into the earth. So we would sit on a bench either side. It was very damp. It, it was smelled like ba damp sand. Uh, and we had no music or anything. We just sat there with our little cases which had my doll in it and her clothing. <laughs> and, you know, we, we just took what we felt was precious. And Hugh had a very different war experience. Yes, he did. Your husband. What was his experience? Yes. Well, he was Jewish. He was part of the kinder transport. And while he was on his way to England, his family in Prague was being sent to Theresienstadt, where they were all gassed. He was the only one from that family that survived. 1967. It was our centennial, yeah. my centennial project, yes. 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 Um, he would have been totally happy with no land at all. He loved to walk, especially with a dog. He did that every day. But he wasn't, he said, I love to see it when you're with the animals. But he was not an animal person at all. So that was fine. He brought home the money. Do you remember <laughs> your first impression of this place? Yes, it was turquoise paint everywhere. Everywhere. Every room, every bit. Gold and silver speckled tiles. Yet you fell in love with it. Yes. Well, I could see the possibilities. And as I wasn't working, once Hugh had gone to work, I used to cut little holes and see what was behind. And one day, I'd just taken off a very little bit of this, and I'd taken off the one that was loose. I, I can't tell you which one it was now. And I'm up on a chair holding this beam, and Joe Grant knocked on the door. And I said, Joe, can you come and help me? And he's a big chap, you know. And so he just took the beam and held it. And I can't remember what we did. He probably pulled it out and put it down. But <laughs> <laughs> it was very lucky. <laughs> and did you realize that you were living so close to the border when you first bought it? No, I'm sure not. I don't think we looked around. We looked at the land and the buildings, the barns and things. Richard was always going across and he had a friend over there. And we never thought, should we check out this family? He would go in there and have the day with them and eat with them. And it never occurred to us, probably nor to them either. You know, check out when this little, where this little boy comes from. He's from another country. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so the policeman arrived here one morning and said, morning, ma'am, I want to see your son, please. And I said, okay, well, he's upstairs. So, Richard, there's a policeman here to talk to you. And Richard came down and he said to Richard, when you go into the States, 
will you please lift your bicycle over the two wires? Because those two wires go to Champlain Village, to the police station, and I have to come all the way up here, and I see it's a small boy on a bike. Because they couldn't tell by the sound. So it was like a trip wire. I don't know what you call it, but he would know which way he w they were going. Beep, 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 beep. So... <laughs> <laughs> so that was the Roxham Road border. Little boys going across on bicycle. <laughs> yeah. And when did that start changing? That that Roxham Road wasn't so Probably when the um, Olympic team the the Israeli Olympic team now 72 in Munich. Mm. Because after that if any of us walk down the road here with friends, you know, they like to just go for a little walk. Mm -hmm. uh, they would stop us and say, where are you from? And we'd say, well, this is our driveway here. Oh, you know, they didn't really trust us. And they were very nervous. You, you'd, because uh, we had our bedroom downstairs, originally that's where it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, you saw these lights at night going back and forth. They were just so scared something was going to happen, I think. So that was after the, so after the 70s, and then moving farther forward, where, where did you see other changes happening at people crossing or not being allowed to cross? Well, we used to see about four or five people a summer, and obviously they've walked from somewhere. There would be ladies in saris carrying babies. I mean, incredible. And apparently, if you did anything with them, like, say, come in for a cup of tea, or do you want to use the phone? Um, I, th I don't know whether you could be arrested, but it, it was not allowed. When did you first, do you first remember seeing people walking up the road from the States? Fairly early on, I guess. We're talking the 1970s, 1980s? Yeah, 1970s, I would think. There was always somebody walking up the road. When do you recall the, the seeing for the first time people who are actually seeking asylum in Canada? I would say from the very beginning. Really? Like the, you mentioned a woman Well, you'd, a you'd see people, I mean, let's say three or four a summer. Yeah. Like the black man, the lady in the sara. Sorry. Um, I can't remember. Mostly women. Mm -hmm. Mostly women. Mm. And, and one time there was a woman with two children and she was walking up and she was looking at everything. Oh, and she said, am I in Canada? I said, yes, you are. She must have just walked through. She had no luggage, nothing. Yeah. Obviously, she was going to try and make her way to Montreal, presumably, where she had. Because I would say to them, uh, do you want to phone somebody, you know? Well, one night I was sitting here about 25 years ago. I was sitting here doing something at night, and we have no curtains. And I saw this bicycle just scraped against the wall, and the guy got off. And he started talking to me because he could see me. And I said, I can't hear you. So I went outside. He said, am I in Canada? I said, yes, you are in Canada. <laughs> And he said, I need to get to Montreal. Well, I said, don't go at this time of night anyway. I did not say, come in and <laughs> spend the night here. I said, there's a motel just up the road. Don't go in the dark. Mm. And of course he went, and I heard the police car coming. <laughs> yes, I put up a sign at the gate so that immigrants could see it, and it said, refugees. Welcome. I mean, we, I think we all became aware that there was a real need for, for somebody to do something because there were so many coming over. I didn't really talk to anybody except my neighbour because we all knew we were on the same path, you know, there wasn't any discussion about it. Mm. But if you didn't like it, you made a big noise. <laughs> yes. yeah. But people who uh, don't, don't see it, they, they don't see it, will never see it. They were scary. In fact, I took a video of them, which I saw the other day on my iPad, of them walking down here. The noise! 
they were banging drums, um, sticks, and one, there's a policeman standing there like this, and this man, who's quite large, has got a long stick and he's poking the policeman. And the policeman is just looking like, you better not do that much longer. Because I think it's always marvelous and very exciting when you're part of something and it's doing good and you're enjoying yourself. The uh, shuttle bus came from the airport and out jumped a little black boy, probably f four or five, and he ran up to me with his arms open and hugged me. <laughs> yes, and I thought that was so lovely. <laughs> yeah. Little boy, yes. He thought, this is somebody I can hug. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a very positive thing, you know. Things are getting better because obviously they've been through something so terrible that they don't want to stay any longer and they have no means of carrying anything other than what they can hold. I mean, it's an incredible feeling. What's an incredible feeling? The... For them. Mm -hmm. For them. And I realize that we can't really talk to them. You, you can see, they're thinking of something else. They're thinking, <laughs> am I going to be accepted? Am I going to be turned back? You know, th their eyes aren't lo really looking at you. And so uh, you don't really say, I usually just say, good luck. And I was saying good luck to this guy once, and, the, and we were in the American side, and this policeman yelled at me, if you go on talking to that person, I'll uh, come and arrest you. <laughs> what is it that's been the most difficult for you about doing this refugee support work? I think seeing that the police, they're not allowed to smile, they just have to stand there, and, and then you hear them talking this nonsense about going the, to the 15, which, how are they going to get to the 15? The taxi's gone. It's five miles, I think, 5K. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, I don't think it's practical. I, I think they should be seeing a video of horror stories in those countries to, to have some idea. Right. So you, you think that, that the RCMP should be given training about yes, what absolutely. people are fleeing from? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like they give training for all kinds of stuff, don't they? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Child abuse or whatever. So why do you think that's so, that they should be given that training? Because they don't look affected. <laughs> I don't know whether they are or not. But I think they would be a little bit more gentle with people. Maybe they have to say those things. But they could say them not like, if you go there, you'll have a good time, and here we're going to, uh, we might arrest you, or whatever they say. I don't know. But I, I just feel that they should see the background of what these mm -hmm. people are fleeing from mm -hmm. to, to affect them, you know? And if, if you were going to give a message to uh, about how, thinking about how you would like Canada to receive refugees coming to our borders, what, what would be your wish for how Canada would treat refugees coming here? Humanely. And what would that look like? <laughs> um, well, not like Trump and his kids all in cages, mm. you know. I, I don't know. I think every situation should be looked at with your heart. So you can say, well, really, we should try and do this. You know, because it is a terrible thing for them. You've been so engaged and you've been so giving of yourself, of your time, of your farm, of your energy, of your creativity. Um, why do you do that? Why is this fulfilling work for you to do to support refugees who are crossing? When I was growing up at home, my mother said to me, Susan, find something good for you to do. I was in boarding school. Good for you to do 
um, that you can help the community. Helping somebody who isn't as well off as you are, mm -hmm. uh, not, nothing to do with money, but to, to do with life, life experiences. Mm -hmm.